Good morning. I am Reverend Dr. Mark Boyer, the minister here at First Parish Church Congregational in beautiful Manchester by the Sea, Massachusetts. And I welcome you once again to our weekly time of remembrance and celebration of God's presence and power and goodness and challenge and call for our lives. First Parish Church Congregational, the congregational part of our name, signifying our long-standing tradition within Christianity of the recognition of the equality of all people in God's eyes and our insistence on out of that democratic governance as a spiritual community. It also means that I welcome you here to this place where no matter who you are or where you are on your life or spiritual journey, you are fully, completely welcome. And so in that spirit, I now welcome you to join us in the singing of our opening hymn, Forward Through the Ages, the words which are printed in your online bulletin.
And we will now join together in our opening prayer, the words to which are also in your online bulletin. God of all people and places, you call us to see all people in all places as yours. You call us to see them as our equally loved and valued sisters and brothers. But in this time of division and conflict, we struggle to do that. In this time, we too often close our eyes, ears, minds, and hearts to those who are different from us economically, geographically, politically. In this time, we too often conclude that they are not worthy of our care and compassion. In this time, we too often see and treat them as less than us, less faithful, less patriotic, even less human. Forgive us for this, Holy One. Lead us to do and be better. Lead us away from over-simplistic characterizations of others. Lead us away from tribalism. Instead, lead us to put your call to be part of the body of Christ before all other bodies. And we pray all this in the name of the one you sent to show us and teach us what life in that body looks and sounds like. Jesus the one who gave us these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, 
In case you needed any evidence that God has a sense of humor, you no doubt noticed that the first two lines to the solo that Paul just sang for us after you spent several minutes not being able to see or hear us were eye hath not seen and ear hath not heard. So there you go. Good one, God. So as we join together now for our time of prayer, I ask you to continue to hold in your hearts, minds, and spirits all healthcare workers and scientists, and first responders, all those people who are continuing to work diligently to alleviate and eventually end the harmful consequences, the death and the suffering associated with COVID-19. We ask you to continue to hold in your hearts and minds and spirits all those working peacefully on behalf of equal justice for all God's people. We ask you to continue to hold in your thoughts and prayers the people on the West Coast who continue to suffer from the effects of wildfires, as well as we ask you to continue to hold in your thoughts and prayers teachers, students, parents, and school leaders who continue to work through this fall to the best of their abilities to aid our children in their educational efforts and knowing of the uncertainty that will be coming upon us as the weather grows colder. We also ask you to continue to hold in your thoughts and prayers those who continue to contract and suffer from COVID-19, especially all of our leaders, that they may recover quickly and well. Please also continue to hold in your thoughts and prayers some of the members of our spiritual community, Susan Nicholas, who had surgery this past week, Bruce Westcott, who continues to recover from uh, his bout with shingles, and Sheila Kafer, who continues her recovery from surgery. We also have some things to celebrate on this day. We celebrate the fact that Will Heslop will be celebrating a birthday on this coming Saturday. And we also celebrate with the Flynn family. Brian and Alyssa Flynn are our newest members. They joined the church just before heading out to Switzerland, where Brian is a professional hockey player. They'll be back uh, in the spring and summer months. Their son, Jameson, has his first birthday tomorrow, so we celebrate with them as well. And then one last celebration. Jason Smith, our own Jason Smith from this congregation, who is a Jungian analyst, uh, had his book published this past Thursday, a book titled Religious But Not Religious, Living a Symbolic Life. And so we look forward to, uh, to reading Jason's thoughts and we celebrate with his accomplishment. So now I invite you to add to all of those prayer intentions anything else that you wish to present before our God. Either share them with those who you might happen to be with or simply present them to God in the silence of your own hearts and minds.
invite you to join me in prayer. Holy One, we open our ears, eyes, minds, hearts, and spirits to you this morning. We open them up to your word. We open them up to your wisdom. We open them up to your strength and courage. And we open them up to your love. And so lead us. Lead us to your word and wisdom. Lead us to your strength and courage and lead us to your love. Lead us toward those things. And lead us away from all that tempts us to ignore, dismiss, or refuse them. Lead us away from refusing to embrace your wisdom, courage, strength, and love for ourselves and refusing to share them with others. Lead us as we prayed together already this morning, not into temptation. Lead us away from temptation. The temptation to see anyone as less than because they are not as wealthy or powerful or influential or well-known as others. Because you say no one is less than. Lead us away from the temptation to see anyone as more than. More than others because of their wealth or power or influence or fame or education. Because you say that no one is more than. And most of all, lead us away from the temptation to see anyone as unnecessary. As expendable because of their economic status, or their gender, or their race, or their ethnicity, or their sexual orientation, or because of their religious or political affiliation. Lead us instead, Lord, to do the hard work of working through our differences. The hard work of listening, asking questions, the hard work of understanding as much as trying to be understood. Lead us, God, to do the work of being the body of Christ, where while some ideas and beliefs might be unnecessary, no person ever is. Because you say that we are all needed, O oh God, that we all belong to you. And that should be enough for us. Amen.
I'm going to share these words from the first letter from the early Christian leader Paul to the church in the ancient Greek city of Corinth. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as God chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the members of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And those members of the body that we think less honorable, we clothe with greater honor. And our less respectable members are treated with greater respect whereas our more respectable members do not need this. But God has so arranged the body, giving the greater honor to the inferior member, that there may be no dissension within the body, but the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. <clears throat> so, just in case you might have missed this story, because it has admittedly kind of gone under the radar for the last several months, there's an election taking place in our nation. I know, I know, right? Who knew? In fact, that election has already started. Early voting is underway in a number of states, including this one, and the official election day is just a little over two weeks away. So I figured, what better Sunday than this to talk politics? Now, I know, I know. Hold on, bear with me. I know, I know, I'm not supposed to talk politics in church. But Paul did it. Paul talked politics to the early Christian community that he founded in the ancient Greek city of Corinth. Except that the politics that Paul talked about wasn't politics like we automatically get to when we hear that term in our time and place. Paul didn't talk about allegiance to a particular candidate or allegiance to a particular political party. That's not the politics that Paul was talking about. Instead, Paul talked about politics in its original sense of the word, in the meaning that it held in the Greco-Roman world that he was a part of. Politics as in the body politic, the common life of the community, the society, with the goal of the common good. <clears throat> so just like Paul, I have no intention of talking politics, as in candidates and political parties, or at least the choosing of one or the other. Let's talk about the body politic. About 30 years after Jesus' death, and 
within just a few years after his spiritual transformation from Saul to Paul, from Christian persecutor to Christian leader, the spiritual transformation that we explored for a couple of Sundays not too long ago, after that transformation, Paul goes to the ancient Greek city of Corinth to start a brand new Christian community. Corinth was a port city, which meant that it had residents and visitors from all over the known world. It was a place where every conceivable idea and opinion and position on moral and ethical and spiritual matters existed. A number of those attitudes and positions tending toward, I guess, what we could call the libertine side. Some scholars have referred to ancient Corinth as the uh, Vegas of the Greco-Roman world. It was also a place of enormous cultural and social and economic diversity as well. A place where Jews and Greeks lived, rich and poor, well-educated, not so educated, slaves, landowners, every conceivable social and economic and cultural subgroup. Not an easy place to start a brand new Christian community, you would think. But one of the other things we know about Paul is he wasn't exactly one to shy away from a challenge. He goes to Corinth and gets that Christian community off the ground. But then, as was also Paul's way, he didn't stick around. He leaves to go off and start other new Christian communities in other parts of the Greco-Roman world. But he never loses touch with the Corinthians. They continue to correspond with each other by letter, which is how Paul learns a year or so after he leaves Corinth that that Christian community he founded is struggling. That those differences, the differences that they have come into that community with, all those social and economic and cultural and moral and ethical and spiritual and political differences, all of those differences have gone from difference to dissension. They are threatening to tear the body politic of that early Christian community apart, limb from limb, organ from organ. And so Paul responds. He responds with what was in that time and place a very common metaphor, the human body. He says to the Corinthians that just as a body has m many and many different members and organs to it, but it's still one body, so it is, so it must be with the body of Christ, with the community of those who follow Jesus and the God that he embodies. And then Paul uses that metaphor to push back against some things. For example, he pushes back against a couple of aspects of the ethos of the Greco-Roman body politic. He pushes back against that ethos, part of that ethos that says that those of lower status, lower economic or social or cultural status, should simply stay in their place. Paul says, no. Not in the body politic of Christ. Everyone shares equal place in God's eyes and in that body. And he also pushes back against what's been referred to as the dispassionate self-sufficiency of the Greco-Roman ethos. 
Paul says that that completely misses the reality of the interconnectedness and interdependence of humanity, just like the interconnectedness and interdependence of the members, the parts of the human body. And then Paul pushes back against three attitudes, three attitudes that have emerged within that Christian community and that underlie the dissension it is experiencing. The first attitude is the attitude on the part of some that others in the community are less than. That because of their social or economic or cultural standing in the overall body politic, they are less than. Paul says no. No one is less than in the body politic of Christ. The second attitude underlying the dissension that Paul pushes back against is the idea on the part of some that because of their social and cultural and economic status, they are more than others in the community. And of course, Paul says no to that as well. And then there's the third attitude. The third attitude that Paul pushes back against. And the one that at least it seems to me is his greatest concern. The attitude that he expresses with the words, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. The hand cannot say to the feet, I have no need of you. Paul pushes back against that idea. That idea of I don't need you. That anyone in the community can be looked on as unnecessary. Because Paul knows that while those first two attitudes that you're less than, or believing that I am less than. The idea that you are more than, or believing I am more than. Those attitudes can and have caused their great share of psychological and emotional and spiritual harm through the centuries. It's that third attitude. I don't need you. That is the most destructive of all. whether it is to a spiritual community or a nation. To borrow a phrase that became popularized when the renowned author Joan Didion used it in the title of a book she wrote a few years ago, it is magical thinking. It is magical thinking to believe that whichever candidate wins the presidency, or whichever political party ends up after this election being elected to a majority in the Senate. It is magical thinking to believe that any of those results will make the dissension in our body politic automatically disappear. What also will not disappear regardless of the results of this election, are the people that we disagree with politically. They're not going anywhere. Despite the jokingly, and I think sometimes not so jokingly, reference back in the 2016 election of there being a mass exodus to Canada, depending upon which candidate, which party won. I'm reminded of a cartoon that I heard about recently, a line of Canadians standing at the American border like this going, oh, I'm sure they'll be here soon. It's not going to happen, folks. It's not going to happen. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do after the election? More specifically, what are we as the body of Christ going to do after the election? 
Because according to a recent survey, 60 to 70 percent of Americans believe that those who are affiliated with the political party that is not theirs are a serious threat. A serious threat. Which, as some political scientists have, have suggested, means that over the last several decades, we have had a movement in our society, a movement from, I disagree with you on this issue, to, I disagree with you in general politically, to, I disagree with you about everything politically, to, I don't like you because you're on the other side, to, I hate you because you're on the other side. Which leaves one last step. The next step on that path is I don't need you because you are with the other side. I don't need you. And that is the most destructive step of all. Because that is the step that as as David Livingstone Smith, who is a philosophy professor, who has spent most of his career studying inhumanity and the effects of it, the dramatic effects of it, Smith says this idea of I don't need you, that others are expendable, is a fundamental aspect of the dehumanization that results in things like societal collapse civil wars, ethnic cleansing. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do as the body of Christ after this election? It's also magical thinking to believe that there is some one overriding comprehensive thing that can be done to heal our body politic. That's magical thinking, too. There isn't one thing that one person can do to make that healing happen. But as is the case with healing in general, it is more often than not a process, a process of smaller steps, smaller steps that each of us, each of us can take. So let me just throw out a handful of, let's call them, small acts of healing. Small acts of healing resistance that we can take, at least consider taking. Several of them based, again, on Smith's understanding of the process of dehumanization, the process of thinking that others are expendable. Smith points out that in the process that leads to dehumanization, words matter. Words matter. Because words don't just reflect our beliefs and our emotions. They can also help to generate them to strengthen them, even to incite them. So as one small act of healing resistance, perhaps we could stop throwing certain words around carelessly. Words like right-winger, left-winger, radical, snowflake, ungodly, unchristian, un-American. Yeah, those are emotionally loaded words, but what do they mean? Do they really tell us anything about what a person thinks or believes or feels about a particular issue? And while we're on that, another word, another word I would like to see disappear is the word outrage. Outrage. If I had a dollar for every time I have, I have seen the word outrage in a headline, 
heard a pundit use it or heard a political leader use it in reference to something that the other side has, has done, I would be outrageously wealthy. Is it an outrage or is it something we simply disagree with? And again, related to this idea of the importance of words. As Smith points out, <clears throat> We need to stop feeling that something is automatically wrong because it comes from the other side. Related to that, perhaps we could consider maybe not Schadenfreude-ing as much. I know I made that word up. But maybe we could stop Schadenfreude-ing each other a little bit less, celebrating, being happy, or, or even at least not being upset about the misfortune that reaches people on the other side. It is, incre it is incredible to me that people who consider themselves part of the body of Christ celebrated the fact that the president came down with the coronavirus. Incredible to me. If we're going to talk about unchristian, that seems pretty unchristian to me. And then one last thing. And again, back to Smith's work. Smith says that we need to constantly keep in mind three things. We need to constantly keep in mind that it is not our inclination as humans. It is not our natural inclination as humans to see others as expendable. It's not. But, he says, we also need to keep in mind, too, that we are all vulnerable to moving in that direction. We're all vulnerable to it. And then the third thing he says we must constantly keep in mind is that that vulnerability can easily be exploited by those who have something to gain from it. And so we must keep that in mind and we must stay vigilant. Small acts of healing resistance done with a sense of urgency. See, Paul wrote that letter to the Corinthians with a sense of urgency behind it. That sense of urgency stemmed from the fact that the belief in the early Christian church was that Jesus was coming back tomorrow. That Jesus' return was imminent, and so they needed to get their house in order. Well, Jesus didn't return. but they still needed to get their house in order. Because Jesus' return was connected with something called the Day of Judgment. So they needed to get their house in order. Again, Jesus' return might not be imminent for us. Might not be tomorrow. But we still need to get our house in order. Our body politic needs to be healed, and God is looking for us to help do it. So that when the day of judgment comes, we'll be judged favorably. Amen.
I'd like to thank you once again for joining us this morning for our time of remembrance and celebration of God's presence and power and goodness and challenge and call for our lives. I would also like to thank the other members of our worship team for their leadership this morning, Dr. Herman Weiss, Rebecca Shrimpton, Paul Knox, Richard Smith, and Cindy Boyer. I certainly hope that if you have some time, you will join us for our virtual friendship hour immediately following the conclusion of this worship celebration. And if you've been with us today, please, if you haven't already, let us know and let us know how we can contact you so that we can let you know about the many and various opportunities for spiritual growth that, that exist here at First Parish Church Congregational. So now, my friends, it is time for us to leave this sacred space and go out into the world rededicated, recommitted to being the body of Christ for this nation, to insisting that all of the members of the body are not just wanted, but needed, but necessary, that the only way towards the true body politic of the common good is together to do the hard work of understanding what other people really believe and feel and how and why to ask more questions. Because the reality of another recent survey is that we tend to wildly exaggerate the extremity of the views and positions and opinions of those we believe are on the opposite side of the political spectrum. That being the case, we must do more work at getting to the reality of what people think and feel and believe. Because again, it is about not just the body of Christ, but the body politic of this nation. It is a great challenge, but it is one that God has given us. But God will also give us the strength and the courage to complete that task. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen.